Hello everyone, I'm up for nomination for Best British Podcast, so if you could kindly take a minute and click the link in my bio and type in James English and place your vote, it'd be very much appreciated. Thank you. Can you make sure you click the subscribe button for my channel and the notifications button so you will be updated when my next podcast goes out? You can also follow me on social media. My Facebook page is James English 11. My Twitter is James English 0. My Instagram is James English 2. And you can also download these podcasts on Podbean and iTunes. And we're on. We're on. Yes, and today's guest, we've got Billy Moore. How are you, brother? Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, good man. Read the book, watched the film. Fascinating. Very interesting. You've had a, a bit of a mad life growing up in Liverpool. Um, spent a lot of time in prisons, I think over 22, 20 prisons. 22 prisons. Yeah, yeah. 22 prisons. and um, Yeah, you've had a, a experience and a half, but... It'd be good to go right back to the start and how it all began and how you got involved in the stuff you got involved in. Yeah, yeah it's a good start to be honest. Uh, the beginning is it's always see I never like woke up one day and said I'm going to have a career in in in, in crime and, and spending years and decades in fact in prisons. I wanted to be a boxer. Uh, I wanted to impress my dad. I wanted to show him that you know I could be somebody. And the reality of it was. He was an alcoholic. I lived in a violent household. Um, I was quite vulnerable, quite scared. I felt separate and different and alone even growing up. And eventually, you know, anything I tried to do, never, um, I, never got, I never got the acceptance or the approval that I wanted of him. Um, so I found myself standing on the street corners and finding approval and acceptance of, of kids my own age. In, um, in the streets of Liverpool, I mean, I found that really difficult to, uh, you know, I boxed for a long time, up until, well, see, when I say a long time, I mean, from the age of 11, you know, started Kratty at first, it was like, take, uh, it was Schultz and Kratty, I tried that, it wasn't for me, I was never good at football because I'd never get picked, you know, I was one of them kids that I'd always get chosen last and I'd always be the goalie or, you know, we're going to have him, so I thought I'll do something that's, for myself and, and I boxed for a little while, you know, and I won a few fights. Um, I started to build my own self-esteem up by doing that. Started to feel good about myself. Didn't need uh, my self-esteem from other people then. Um, and then girls, you know, meeting girls, spending time with their friends and, you know, trying out drugs. But for me, the minute I put a drug in my body, I realised that it took away all that all those feelings of uh, loss and... Uh, abandonment. And, yeah, abandonment and rejection and, and, and fear. You know, I, I had that courage to to be someone's difference. Um, but I also had an allergy. You know, I wasn't the kind of person that broke out in lumps and bumps. I broke out in handcuffs, pain, misery and loss. You know, and, and, I, and I spent years in, um, in correctional facilities uh, in isolation most of the time. And... I suppose I felt comfortable on my own, you know, getting labelled as well as like, uh, he's nuts or he's round a bend or he's, he's crazy or he's, he's schizo, he's a schizo and feeling comfortable with all those labels. You know, mm. But when I was on my own in a cell and the door was shut, I knew how lonely I felt, you know, I felt really, really lost, really lonely. Um, and what age were you, Billy, when you first got to jail? 16. Yeah. What was the crime for? I think it was a swock back then. It was taken without only consent. It was a car theft, but it was a few. They all added up. And it was like, at the beginning, it was a, um, I think it's called UTMV today. No. Oh, no, sorry. It was UTMV back then. And yeah. That was called swock. You know what I mean? Which is unauthorised taking of motor vehicles. Um, handling stolen goods, burglary, theft. Um, they were all the initial kind of arrest that he had in the beginning the kind of usual suspects to like I say if you're in that if you're 
kind of got those abandonment issues, you're kind of searching for something, you're craving that maybe attention if you're doing bad stuff, we get that adrenaline rush yeah. where we feel good and then we're, we've got that buzz that we, we don't get. So we end up dabbling into drugs to get that dopamine kick where we're feeling good, we feel alive. Yeah. And before you know it, you it just gets worse and worse and worse with the drugs. When did you start hitting the drugs kind of seen it? The it's heavier stuff? The heavier stuff. I mean, it started with cannabis initially and that was the gateway drug. And then from then on, it was... Um, LSD, without going into a drugology of things, yeah. it was like, it, it, it soon spiralled into uh, using heroin and crack cocaine. You know, within months of being in the grip of that drug, I was in prison. I was in a young offenders, and I remember the first time I went there, um, I was uh, in withdrawal stages. Uh, there was no help or rehabilitation or any kind of medication that he gave you back then. So you put you in a cell, and you're on a hardcore cold turkey, and it was... Um, and I always, pro I'll never, never do this again. I'll never do it again. And then I'd say within two weeks of being released, I was back at it. And I was on that cycle of um, repeating the same mistakes, but accepting, ex 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 you know, expecting different results. Mm -hmm. When you went, uh, did you get clean? Did you go to rehab, get clean, and then went to Thailand to change your life? Yeah, well, well it's, that was... Um, 2003 was like a significant moment in my life. I remember being on the yard in HMP Liverpool and I was looking around thinking, you know, I don't want to be here. You know, I couldn't face reality. Um, I needed help, but I didn't know how to ask for it. And it was the office day of the year and a few of the lads decided to stay out and climb on the roof. And I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> uh, three lads climbed on the roof and the first guy that got up there, the whole prison, screamed with yells of approval, all the windows were banging, everyone was going, go ahead, lad. And I looked up and thought, I want a bit of that. And I was the third guy up, and I climbed up, and halfway up, I slipped and fell down. And I remember this, this screw call, Mr. Muscle, saying, you'll never get up there, you fat ass. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> you know, that pride and that ego, and, you know. I'll show him. Yeah, I'll show him, and the failure. Uh, so I climbed up, and I was halfway up again, and I was struggling. You know, and the rest of the guys that were up there pulled me up and it turned into something like an North Sea rescue. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the minute I got up, all the um, all the lads were screaming, all the windows were banging, go on, Billy, he's right. And um, I was like, I felt important at that time. For that moment, I felt really, like, accepted by the prison community. And then it stopped and it was about the guy that was getting up next. You know, my... 15 minutes of fame, so to speak, it ended. But when I, I always speak about this because it became a really significant uh, movement in, in, in my decision making. I went to um, a prison after that, spent a long time in solitary confinement due to my behaviour. And I remember when the door got shut, I'd feel really hurt and lost and that, and I, I'd have tears in my eyes. But when that door had opened, I'd pretend, I'd put a mask on and, and I'd act as if Everything was uh, okay. And there was no one I could speak to. You know, everyone had shut the door on me. I'd be in tall bridges. And he had a couple of pounds on the credit, the phone credit, and I thought, I'll phone my mum. And I remember speaking to my mum on the phone and she's saying, um, I remember getting opened up, actually, and these two big screws took me to the phone. And I'm acting hard, walking with a swagger. And um, the minute, the minute, um, my mum answered the phone and heard my voice. She was quite like, where are you and what's going on? And I knew, you know, that she cared and I had a lump, I had a lump in my throat and I felt really emotional and I couldn't, um, I couldn't answer her. And um, she knew, she just said, I know, you need help. And that was the first time that I put pen to paper and wrote a letter to um, a probation officer requesting help and it came in the form of a... Um, a rehabilitation in Bristol and that's where I went that's where I got my recovery how long were you in recovery for? initially it was three years how were you feeling? then? well I was going through lots of loss really it was um, and lots of blame you know, I blame my dad for the for the way it turned out um, you know there was lots of sadness but I was also excited as well at the, the opportunity of getting a new kind of 
way of life in it. A new it? life. Yeah. So is that when you decided to go to Thailand? Well, it's funny, really. Um, I've got a passport, you know, the recovery accessories. I've got a phone, a passport, a few friends that liked me, um, the odd girlfriend. And then someone offered me, you know, the opportunity to go to Thailand for three months on a backpack and all of the... I shaved up and went along to Thailand and I'm like a world class card carrying pleasure seeker, you know what I mean? I enjoy, you know, mm-hmm. anything that's good I'll I'll tear the arse out of it. <laughs> so when I got there, you know, it was uh, I had no kids, you know, I wasn't in a relationship, I had no ties, there was just me. I spent years, you know, in segregation units and prisons and I and I thought this is it, you know, I'm gonna live here. So when my friend went back, I decided to stay, you know, and adopt a new culture and learn a new language, which was a bad idea because I was quite immature emotionally as well. So it just opened a, a, a gateway to yeah. get kind of sucked in and, and back to where you were in Liverpool. Yeah. When you got the jail in, was it Bangkok, Hilton, Bangkok? Clong Bangkok. Prem. It was Clock Prem. Clong Prem, it was a uh, lad yao Clong Prem. Um, I went to two prisons in Thailand. I went to the, the initial one was Chiang Mai, and then from Chiang Mai, after spending a year there, they took me down to Bangkok in uh-huh. Khlong Prem prison. And that was three years. Three years. Because in there, the first night you were there, you were sleeping next to a dead body. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I got taken from the the courts and marched into this shell block that had, I think it was seventy nine prisoners. There was nowhere to sleep, you know. There was a little piece, little space in the corner. It was next to a lady boy and a guy who died the night before. Um, and I remember the, the, the Thai lady boy's name was Tiffany, and she had this little top on that said "No money, no honey." <laughs> in big bold letters, and I thought, "I'm grateful I've got no money because I'm more interested in the honey." And I remember him saying to me, "I like your blue eye." <laughs> and I was thinking, "I hope you don't like the brown one." You know what I mean? And that was I kind of got through. Them first few days with a bit of a, you no, know, maybe you know, uh, I don't know, just like that resilience, that that mm. that there's something within. I'm not gonna kind of like end up dead in one of these places. You know what I mean? Because did you count as well? Twenty five dead bodies get carried out the first yeah, week. The first week there was twenty five bodies taken out the out the prison in white sheets. You know, we were stepping over them, getting our medication in the hospital. It was quite. It's quite daunting, that. Yeah, uh, quite, quite uh, surreal uh, as well. And, and it became normal. And you know, when you were talking about like being conditioned, I got conditioned to accept that as normality in the end. You know, I seen some guy stab himself in the neck, stab himself in the chest. He had HIV, blood was pouring out of every orifice. Um, and everyone was like shocked and looking. And, and my first thought was, I can get some water while everyone's looking and distracted by him. Mm-hmm. It, it just became normal. This is like year after year of, of witnessing uh, these kind of horrific ways yeah. of living yeah it's, um, because over there there's a lot of drugs in these prisons there's a lot of knives is there any guns in these prisons no there's no just um, knives yeah there was, c- there was a lot of knives uh, ice picks machetes I mean these are uh, these are <laughs> they're not like homemade shivs that you get in prisons in the UK these were like 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 full blown machetes and hatchets and Cogs off bikes, you know, like the the, the cogs that they use uh-huh. because they use them to chop up the ice, and and these are the uh, the instruments that they they're being given. Because obviously that played a big part in, in your book, being in that prison, Prayer Before Dawn. Great book, great film as well. When you started, when did you start writing for that? I started writing it when I was in in Thailand, just documenting little bits of what I'd seen and how I felt as well. That was important, you know, being really descriptive and uh, and admitting that I did feel scared and you know, writing that down. And it kind of helped me. And then when I got to Wandsworth Prison, I showed this education teacher an A4 piece of paper that I'd written. She took it away, came back, and went, oh my God, that's amazing, you need to write more. At first, I thought she was stroking my ego, just trying to impress me. But she encouraged me to continue writing, so I did while I was there, because I couldn't really talk to people about what I'd experienced, because they couldn't identify it. They were like, you know, we haven't actually been through those uh-huh. experiences, so we don't really understand. So that helped. It was more therapeutic initially. It wasn't. I didn't expect to write a book. That was the truth. 
I did, it was more kind of to help myself because when I came back, I was um, I had a culture shock. I was speaking fluent Thai by this time. I was quite passive um, due to uh, conditioned in, in prison in Bangkok. And I felt really, I felt alien in a sense when I came back to the UK. Yeah, but it must have fucked with your head over there, especially with the shit you've seen. How was it? There was a lot of lady boys. Yeah. How were they? They were vicious and violent, some of them. Um, but it kind of added to the intimacy of the prison. Yeah. And they used to always play bingo and, you know, bring a different kind of uh-huh. experience as well to the. the yeah, whole. Were they, they were shelling they, themselves. They were, it was like. See, outside in silence, these lazy boys are, are seen as like scum most of the time. But when they were in prison, they were like superstars. Um, they were never my cup of tea in a sense of like, I want a relationship with one of them. Uh-huh. Although in the film, it portrays like Joe as uh, meeting up with this young lady boy called Fame and, and developing a relationship and it became intimate and then it became sexual. Uh, that never happened. That's fiction. By the way. So he said. <laughs> <laughs> and you can Google that. Because <laughs> um, obviously, if you're in prison, the, 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 most, the thing that's on your mind is the most is, is pussy. Is, and if there's people, listen, because I've, I've took girls home from a Saturday night drunk and I've been like, oh, <laughs> what the fuck have I done? So if you're yeah. over there, because some of the lady boys are stunning. Some of them are stunning. Were they a lot in the prison mental health and yeah. like. Most addicts, of, yeah. stuff most, like that. Most, I think most of the lady boys that were in there were all drug addicts. Yeah. They were in for drug dealing or mm. killing boyfriends that, 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 that they felt a bit of injustice around. The beautiful ones that were, they were all taken anyway. So it was, uh, and the ones that had the full operation were segregated right. from the rest of the prison population. So they, well, that's because there was a lot of rapes in those in those prisons, isn't there? Yeah. There's a lot of rapes, and it didn't matter whether you were male or female. To be honest, it's just any old goals with them. You know what I mean? Was there a lot of gang rapes and stuff over there? There was, yeah. There was, yeah. There's a lot of a uh, like I, I don't know how you say genital mutilation. You know what they do with the the, the penis? Just they cut it in half and and put little bits of uh, glass and stitch it up and squeeze it with Vaseline so it's all kind of extended and it looks massive and uh, uh, you know then it, it, they cut the uh, the foreskin into four it looks like flowers and you know what I mean when they stitch it all up it's quite weird what they do to the penises like yeah, that's crazy yeah that's nuts yeah did you ever when you started getting into the the fighting side of it in the prison because you were you were back on the drugs in prison were you not yes it was yeah you'd have to you needed drugs just to kind of get through the day you could, could you get it all right in the prison well it was mostly like medication some as pan volume uh, painkillers yeah the odd <laughs> is he still running <laughs> <laughs> red rum over there <laughs> the, the fighting side of things because you were addicted to drugs but you were, you were fighting a lot in that prison were you not Ah, I was causing a lot of chaos. Um, you know, I couldn't understand what they were saying to me. The language barrier was re- really difficult. And, you know, I thought they were, like, like abusing me and, and insulting me. And they probably were at the time. And, it, you know, you could tell in the, in, in the way they were speaking, it was quite venomous. Um, I just react, you know, with the look. You, you know, I couldn't see what they were thinking, but I could see how they were behaving towards me. Um, so that caused a lot of problems, really. With myself, ended up fighting a lot, um, and it was only down to this one prison officer that said, "You know, you need to kind of change your ways, or you're going to end up dead." Because uh, with the boxing side of things, you were in a bad, you were in a bad car crash or a motorbike, a motorcycle accident. Yeah, I had the motorcycle accidents in Laos. Uh, that was um, I went in, I went from Thailand to Laos to get a visa. It was a visa run, and I was on the wrong side of the road. And it was late, I'd been using drugs at the same time, so I wasn't I wasn't copers mentis. And two taxis, like tuk tuks, come race, they were chasing each other and they come crashing right into me. You know, smashed the bike that I was on and half. The bike, the chassis went up, smashed into my ribs. I had the handlebar punching my lung and one of the brake levers going to my stomach. And I got pushed 
like I got rushed to a, 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 a like a third world hospital in a wheelbarrow with all kind of blood pouring out of me. It was quite horrible, really. Did you try and escape from the hospital? Did I, re I read that that you trying to escape? No, this one initially. This was uh, this was when I got arrested because I had to go for surgery when I was in Bangkok. So the accident had happened before I was arrested. Three months later, I've been incarcerated. I'm in prison. I've still got these injuries. They need looking at. They took me to hospital. Um, I'm on the seventh floor in this hospital in Chiang Mai, and the prison guards are just nowhere to be seen. They just turn up every 15 hours, pop his head in, and that was it. And I, and I realised the pattern that was going on here. And he had a little bit of money off one of the missionaries that come up so I could buy little bits of fruit, a little bit of food that came round, and, and I made this. I was dying for a cigarette, I was smoking at the time. I was just desperate for a ciggy. And I went down the back stairs to the exit, the door was open, and I couldn't believe it. I was outside and there was people on the grass having like picnics and I could see a 7-Eleven in the, in the background with a chemist next to it. And it seemed, it didn't seem that far away. I had shackles on my ankles at the time and I thought I'm gonna go over there just to buy cigarettes. I did, I made it, I made it over there. And instead of going to the shop to buy cigarettes, I went straight into the chemist and bought loads of tramadol painkillers first. Put them away and then went to the shop and got cigarettes. Came back and no one had seen or heard nothing. That was the first time I'd walked out the hospital. And I went back upstairs to bed. And a couple of nights, every night I used to go down the steps and have a cigarette. And no one would be no one would be in sight, no one would be there at all. So I decided to to to, to make a break for it one evening. It was two o'clock in the morning. Went downstairs, out to the exit, climbed over the, the railing fence at the hospital and was walking around the city early hours in the morning. And I thought, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? I can't steal a bike, you know. I can't steal a car. I've got these shackles on my ankles. You know, if I get caught, I'm going to get another 25 years on top because it's a big thing to escape. I could possibly get shot. And I made that decision to go back a couple of hours later. And when I went back, no one else, again, no one had seen me or, or noticed that I'd gone. And I found myself back in my bed, just... I felt quite grateful, to be honest, that I'd made that decision back then. Yeah, because three years is bad enough, never mind getting yeah, another 25 years. And I didn't think the embassy were going to kind of support me or hide me or harbour me or take me to back to the UK and go, right, we've shaved them from... Well, see, when you're in there, how does the embassy treat you? Do you? Are you in contact with anybody? Can they send... Are you trying to get home? Are you trying to get a transfer? Have you got to finish your sentence over there? Well, the embassy used to come up like once a month and just provide you with stamps and writing equipment, really. Not much. They couldn't really do much. and They didn't do much. Prisoners abroad were good. They got us uh, protein tablets and they used to send us 2,000 baht once a month in, which, you know, helped a lot. But I used that money to, to buy drugs. The protein tablets to swap for drugs. Um, I couldn't face reality. I couldn't face the day. I just wanted to sleep it away. Um, it was it was quite austere and barbaric. So anything, any mind or mood altering chemical at that time, you know, was 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 purchased. Over, yeah, it's it's um, do it, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's a tough fucking. It's a tough one over there. Yeah. Did you have a lot of friends with within the vicinity who were British themselves? I didn't get on with the foreigners for some reason. But you know, you know, they kind of uh, fell out with, with them all the time. Very argumentative. They were very different from me. Australians, um, Iranians, Nigerians, lots of Africans. Um, and I didn't, I didn't get on well at all with them. I mean, see, when you were in the fight camp, you were because you were in the the Muay Thai. Yeah. Did that help you in the prison to get away from the bad stuff? Did you have better treatment? I did. What happened? What happened with the boxing? It was. Uh, I used to feel really envious to see them train. You know, when I was desperate, I was fucked on the drugs. You know, and, and then the drugs stopped coming because I couldn't pay for them. You know, so I was hungry and, 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 and I think I was hungry in more ways than one. You know, I was hungry to kind of live as well. And I went along and I tried to join the boxing team and they refused to let me in and, and I kept coming back. And eventually they said, yeah, look, give him a chance here and then I found like unity 
and collectively as a group I was getting supported you know I was getting fed better um, I learned to speak Thai I started to smile a bit more you know I started to enjoy life in prison a lot better than I did when I was using drugs um, some purpose in your life yeah some, fo yeah, some focus some purpose and it was an escape from the conditions for just a, just a few hours, you know, just that training. Because uh, you know, I'd train for like three, four hours a day, constantly. I'd be on the bags, I'd be on the pads, I'd be in the ring, I'd be running around the compound, lifting weights. And when I say weights, it was like two tins of paint with concrete in it and a brush pole. <laughs> you know what I mean? There was no, there was no real weights. It, was like, it wasn't like this gym we're in. With red rum in the background, <laughs> you know what I mean? How was the food? The food was, oh my God, it was like um, sticky rice and uh, like a soup with chicken heads in it. No, the food, oh, it was horrible. I put a spoon in one day and um, pulled out half a chicken fish with an eyeball in it. I was like, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? I went to throw it away and one of the ties grabbed it off my spoon and just started sucking its head. You know, when I, it was just, it was just, it was, it, it stunk as well. It was horrible to, to kind of, um, it wasn't even edible. You couldn't even describe it. Did you ever get food poisoning or? I got a lot of shit. Yeah, a lot of, the, the shits a lot. And I was poorly a number of times. I was in and out of the prison hospital. I don't think that was just due to the food though. Cause in the end, you know, the, the missionaries had come up and they'd buy us bits of, bread and a few cartons of milk and you know that'd help mm -hmm. some fruits as well because like, obviously you've, you've had a lot of lows in your life but you've not let it defeat you no because you've you are working with one of the biggest actors ever in the world um, Sylvester Stallone yeah. you're a stunt double in Rambo how yeah. did that come about? again you know that was just quite random I was in a gym in Chiang Mai and I seen this guy who looked familiar and I asked him was he a boxer? He said no, he was an actor. And he, his name was Matt Marsden and he worked on the set of uh, Coronation Street in the UK. So this is, I wasn't a big Curry fan, but he, he was quite familiar in some areas. I must have seen him somewhere. And I asked him what he was doing and he said he was, um, he was, he was filming a movie called Rambo 4 in, 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 Chiang, in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And I was dead excited for him and you know, all oh. the best. And two weeks later, a casting crew came into the gym where I was training. Took our names, our numbers, a few photographs and said to be in touch with me if they need us. Two weeks after that, I got a call and, and I thought it was one of my mates wired me up. They said, will you be Sylvester Stallone stone standing on Rambo? I went, oh, fuck off. You're having a laugh, aren't you? Mate, it doesn't even look like him. <laughs> he said, no, you've got the shape, you've got the size, you know. His stone standing's got the shits with the green curries and mm -hmm. you know we Checking need someone yeah so you're quite lucky and I was quite fortunate to get the opportunity and the money was shit but I didn't mind going because you know he was my hero I grew up watching Rocky mm -hmm. you know um, I was at that era of growing up of like the Rocky movies and the Rambo movies and um, he was my hero so I was just grateful to be on set and um, you know I met him um, I spent a lot of time with him on Europe 1 he couldn't understand the word that was coming out of my mouth um, he said he needed subtitles to understand me. <laughs> hey man, what the fucking kind of language is this fucking talking about, buddy? <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was um, that was a great experience. I really enjoyed that. You know what I mean? I loved it. And it was quite glamorous. It was an Hollywood movie set, and I was quite fortunate, really. You know what I mean? So, to have these these earlisters. Yeah, yeah. How was it as a person, big sly? It was quite intimidating. Was it initially? Do you think that's because you've watched, you've grown up, grown up watching him. Yeah, it, it was. He, he had that aura of like you know he, there was a presence when he was there. You knew he was there. You know, people people felt a little bit passive around him, and and, and they were, and me being me, I just went right up to him and chat with him, and you know, and I said you're my hero, and he said no man, I'm a fraud. You know what I mean? <laughs> was, I'm just a fraud. Because he's got some story himself. Yeah, he's brilliant. I mean, yeah. I want to respect, I respect his, his journey too and he was, he's a great director and he seemed as if he was always in character. What you see on set and in the movies is what you see in life. Mm -hmm. This is the way he was. Because he was near enough homeless 
And I think because he wrote the script for Rocky yeah. and they wanted to buy it for 100 grand yeah. and they knocked it back because he wanted to play the part. And I think he had to sell his dog and stuff. Yeah, I read that story. Yeah, yeah, that was quite... yeah he sold his dog and it, once he, he got he made Rocky and he, he played the part, he went back to buy his dog. Yeah. I, think was, I think he sold it for about a hundred dollars. I might butcher this story here, but I think he sold it for a like hundred dollars and they wanted to buy it back for like ten grand. I think he got the dog back. So yeah. is that great? He created his own opportunities. And, he created, he created, yeah. and that's what it's all about in life is, is creating your own opportunities and yeah. you you don't make you, you can make your situations worse or you can make them better, including yourself. You've been in a prison where you've probably one of the lowest points of your life and you've created it into a book and a yeah. film where you've got you've won awards and You've did you've did massive things. So when the book, when you wrote first wrote the book, did you see it going as big as you thought? No, do you know to be to be to be honest, I was um, when I was in that prison in Thailand. I've got to say how it is. I wanted to end my life. I remember asking this Thai guy to sell me his shoelaces, and he said I can't, because he knew what I wanted to do. And I said, why can't you do that for me? He said because collectively as a group as a shell we'll get punished, and it's you know it's one of the rules that you can't kill yourself. And I thought, how bizarre is that? Because every morning there'd be 10 rules. And one of those rules was you can't commit suicide. And I thought, how fucked up is this jail? You know what I mean? You can't have sex. You can't, you can't sell drugs. You can't have weapons. You can't kill yourself. All these rules got listed off. Every single morning, I used to have to get up and stand to attention to the, the Thai national anthem. It was like a prisoner of war camp. How fucked up is that? I was forced to stand there 8 a.m. every morning. And I can remember the you and Nasha da 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 And we'd all have to stand there to attention while the flag went up. <laughs> I was like, fuck this man, I'm not a fucking like prisoner of war. Yeah. yeah, it was weird. And um so yeah, I was at really all point lows where I wanted to end my life and you know people just kept intervening. It was weird, they just kept intervening, you, you know, just be strong. You've only got a small sentence, it's not that long. But a day in there was like a lifetime, you know, anywhere else and when I started writing, it wasn't to write a book, it was to get through the feelings that I'd, I'd experienced. It was horrible, man. It was like, I was, I was writing about uh, the pain and, and the fear and the loss and, and the loneliness and, and the separation from society. Um, and I was reading it back to myself and I was writing about a, a lot about my dad as well, growing up, you know, the contributing factors that led to, to me drug use. And when I'd read it, I remember sitting in a cell in one's way of prison and reading it and, and sobbing. Because, you know, I couldn't escape the words that were on the paper. I was, I was writing about my dad and, you know, the beatings I'd received and, and the rejection and the abandonments and, and the lack of love. Um, and it's his fault. And, you know, and I know we've got choices, but sometimes the choices that we have in life are taken away from us, especially at an early age. I grew up and, um, you know, I was free and I was carefree and, 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 and I wanted to... I wanted to join the army. I had dreams of joining the British army and, and becoming a great boxer and... You know, and he ended up becoming a drug addict and spending most of my life in prison. You know, and I, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that that's what had happened. So when I started writing this, it was, um, never believed it had even become a book. So when it did become a book and it was published first in Thailand, I was, I was proud of what I'd achieved. I couldn't believe it. Um, it wasn't getting sold in the UK at that time. It was quite small. Not, not many people knew about it. And then I found a publisher in the UK and it became a bestseller within six months. And then I took this book to a production company in Liverpool just to open for a documentary. Something like a little bit of exposure. Okay, I've wrote a story, I'd like the people to read it, um, get a little bit of exposure about it, maybe a documentary. And they took it off me. At first, they, they wouldn't... Uh, they wouldn't accept it they told me to go away I kept coming back I said look you need to read this um, and they were hiding all the time from me in the end they took it I think they felt you know they felt look we'll just do him a favour here because he's doing our editing so they took it so we'll be in touch three months later they got in touch and had me sitting around his table with them saying we love the book in the, the ten years that we've been here as a company we've all put our hands up and said we want this to become a movie and I was like a fucking movie are you serious and then he started talking about A-list actors and you know I think Charlie Unham was on board he was in Sons of Anarchy he was on board for a year and everyone was excited and to be honest I'm glad he never took the role because it wasn't meant for him 
you know, the young kid that uh, got the role, Joe Cole, was absolutely powerful in the performance. I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, and he was keen and he was eager and he wanted this, you know what I mean? Where all the other names were just for the finances. Just accepting it, just for work for them. Yeah, it was like, oh, we'll get in because... And, and he didn't want Joe Cole, right? That's the suit. Um, and I said, why not? Me, the director, wanted Joe Cole. And he went, why not? He said, because he's not a big enough name for the finances. You know, we've got to raise capital on, on people's names. And I said, well, I don't care about raising capital on a name. I just want this story to be told as authentic as possible with someone who's willing to, to, to throw it out. Yeah. He put yeah, his heart yeah. and his soul into that. And, and you know, we, we, we got him. We persevered. But to be honest, the production scene never had a name anyway. You know, so it was it was good that we got him. So it was helping put everybody in the map. Yeah. Do you think the book saved your life then, writing it? I think it's done a bit of both, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Kind of nearly killed me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it allowed me to... Um, it allowed me to, 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 to talk about my past and, and my history briefly and the experiences that I'd been through but then came like the ego you know a lot of people started showing me attention I couldn't cope with that that was quite difficult you know I was getting uh, interviewed a lot I was on the red carpet in Cannes you know I was in a tuxedo I've never even wore a suit unless it was going to court <laughs> I'm in a tuxedo in Cannes um, I've got the paparazzi interviewing me um, and taking pictures and I felt quite like um, it felt, felt quite weird. It felt like it was if it was someone else's life story being portrayed on the big screen, and it wasn't really me. And I didn't feel worthy, you know. I didn't feel feel, feel like I fitted in to society. I felt like a misfit, and I was confused why so, so many people were interested. For me, I was just like a junkie from a council estate that had been through a really tough time in life. Uh, come out the other side and motorbike and, and all of a sudden these people want to turn it into a, to, 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 to a movie it was quite mad really um, and I was you know I, was, I, was, I wasn't savvy in the industry I, I, I admit that I'd kind of been a bit naive and I was misled and you know but you you've know. got to be proud of it yeah, because yeah. It's, it's, it's your legacy that's going to be here from someone who has addiction problems who's not had the best upbringing to been in 22 prisons to be in making a film and a book about you because we spoke earlier there's talk of you've got something else in the pipeline for the future for yourself a part yeah, two yeah I've wrote I wrote I went to prison again I, I came to I seem to I seem, I seem to write I seem to write books when I go to prison so I don't want to do a trilogy. you know what I mean it's not going to be a part three but yeah, this first one I wrote when I was away, the second one I wrote when I was away, and, and the reason I can, I can write like that is because I've got time, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Um, and I'm with myself. You know, outside, there's a lot of distractions. Um, so when I wrote the second one, I call, you know, and I've titled it Surrender from the Heart. See, people ask me why do you call the first one, I pray before dawn. And I remember thinking of a title, I wrote a synopsis, and I was thinking of a title for this new book. And I was thinking, welcome to hell. And, you know, we, we can we can kind of... Dark. They're dark. You know, you know what you're going to expect. And I remember when I was in... I see, I talk about it in the book. I was hungry. And these Muslim guys offered me a bit of food. So I sat down with them and I ate with them. And I thought to myself, I'll come back the next day. So I went back the next day and he said, really, Billy, only the Muslim brothers eat here. These were all Malaysians and, and, and Southern Thai. So, so that's okay. So put a sarong on, changed my name to Yusuf Muhammad. <laughs> I sat with them for a year. You know, I learned to speak Arabic. You know, I read the Quran. I understood. You know, we asked them questions as well because I wanted to know. Yeah. You know, what's, what's all this uh, extremism going on about? What's, what's, you know, I didn't know. I'd only heard what I'd... You see in the news or the yeah, radio? Yeah, see the news, the radio, what I'd read in the papers, what wear the mouth but they were quite lovely they were quite like you know so they moved me into the shell so I prayed five times a day with them and every morning before dawn I'd, you know I'd wake up and, and people would be praying first it'd be the Muslims with the um, chanting the, the sutras you know, every morning that I'd get that I'd read through the prison system and then it'd be 
you know, the in-man would be calling the prayer to Fadja, and that was the prayer before dawn. So, I thought to myself, you've got Christians, Muslims, uh, Buddhists all praying at the same time, and then they open them gates to go out in the compound. It's like, the, it's like, it's like hell on earth, you know, when everyone's fighting just to get through the day. So it was quite ironic, really. So I called it, and I named it, I pray before dawn, but the second one, you know, surrender from the heart. Is, it's more of a backstory, the contributing factors that led up to Yeah. Why is there not, why is it, you not got a picture at the front? I did have one in the front. I don't know, I don't know, they should do. They put a picture of me. I think there's one in, it was not even one on the back, is there? No. <laughs> yeah. I'm not pretty enough. <laughs> no, never mind. Because in there, in, while you were in prison as well, you got a tattoo. Yeah. But the tattoo, they do it. It took over a week, and the tattoo there, they used guitar strings. Rusty guitar strings with ink yeah. where that was smuggled in. Yeah, very painful, very painful, and it cost me a, a sleeve of cigarettes. And I was under the influence of drugs when he asked for it to be done. Uh, I thought it was a good idea at the time. And I was into my Muay Thai boxing and I, 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 I boxed for England as a schoolboy. I was involved with the NABCs, the ABAs, the ABCs. And that was part of my life all the time, fighting. I'd always fought, you know what I mean? And I, I, I you know, fought at home, I'd fought on the streets, I'd fought on the prison landings. And the biggest war I ever fought was with how I felt and admitting that, you know, I, had, I, had, I needed courage to ask for help. So they were kind of like, it was all about fighting. So yeah, I got a Muay Thai boxer put on my back. That tattoo. Guitar strings. The guitar strings, it was quite... And he fucked it up as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? He ran out of ink, right? He ran out of ink and it was... Um, <laughs> the, the fella on the back, in the tattoo, he's got a big pink hairdo. <laughs> and a big bouffant. <laughs> a fuming. Because <laughs> when you were in... And because in that prison as well, it's... You're mixed with paedophiles, and you're not just mixed with like rapists. You're mixed with like rapists, paedophiles. You're no, it's no like sections or protection wings. Or yeah, there's no, there was no numbers or protection. It was like you were, you were, you were banged up. I was banged up with someone's savoury characters, and people knew what they were in for, and no one was, you know, attacking them or, or, or verbally abusing them for the crimes that they committed. And there were horrendous. Some of them, you know, raping on raping two year old babies, and you know, grooming. Kids, you know what I mean? It was horrible. Yes, yeah, it's, it's bad for that over there. It made me feel uncomfortable, to be honest. Yeah, but another big... F <laughs> you've had that many fucking fights in your life, Billy. But you had cancer. Yeah, cancer, cancer in the yeah. neck. See, yeah, and I'd like to talk about that briefly because I was... I'd came back from Thailand, I'd rebuilt my life. I'd got a job working, you know, in the community, helping addicts in recovery. I was full-time employed, had a house by this time, a car, you know, a loving relationship. Five years down the line, and, and my dad had passed away, cancer. Sorry to hear that. Um, I was at his bedside, and I told him I loved him in the elder's hand, and it was, you know, you know, it was heartbreaking because that's, he told me he loved me at the same time when he died, you know what I mean? And that's all he ever wanted from me, dad. And I got this diagnosis pretty quick, Quick, pretty, pretty, like, pretty soon after he passed away and I was on set playing the role of my father that's you know that's how I've kind of acknowledged his, his life playing the role of my dad and um, it was hard because I'd been diagnosed with cancer on set playing the role of my dad watching this, this young lad this young actor come through and the director said to me if you're your father what would you say to your son you know, and all I wanted my dad to say is, I love you. Um, and when this young kid comes towards me and I was looking at him, our eyes locked, and he knew what was going on because he'd done a character study. And it was 5 a.m. in the morning, it was in the Philippines where we were filming, and I was, it was like, I, could, I, I, I was just that emotional. You know, I was, that, I was welling up that much that I couldn't even muster the words I love you to, to, to this young Billy, uh, this young me, really, trying to connect with him. Uh, and then it ended, the movie finished, I went home, the cancer progressed, uh, I was on chemotherapy by this stage, I had three operations, I was introduced back to opiates, production team have moved on, the director's doing his editing, the actor's gone on to other job opportunities, 
you know, I'm left at home now. You know, I'm, I'm shaking mill. Um, you know, my mental health starts to deteriorate. I'm taking more and more drugs to uh, kind of avoid the feelings that I'm feeling. You know what I mean? I don't really, you know, the, 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 the impending zooms in my mind and, you know, waking up thinking I'm going to die because that's all I ever, I, I thought the cancer, cancer was. You know what I mean? You're going to die, simple as. Your dad had passed away, you're going to go. You know, I had that fuck it's kicked in. And any money that I'd made off the movie, which was only little amounts I'd, I'd spent, uh, trying to bury myself in, 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 in a narcotic kind of, kind of stupor. But thankfully you've, you're, you're all clear. Yeah. And, thank, and, and also you're 18 months clean, clean and sober again. Yeah. Well, Shake your hand for that brother. Thank you. Well yeah. Done. 18 months clean today. Um, you know, it was, um, you know, trying to get a morning clean was difficult, but mm -hmm. you know, after all that, you know, you know, I went, I went back to prison, didn't I? I said that before. Um, and I went back to prison clean. I was five months in recovery. You know, and that was a new experience. Spending a year in a prison in Liverpool, being an observer, uh, clean, clear-minded, watching the, um, the drug and use paranoia on the landings, people getting slashed, people stabbing each other, people getting sexually abused with this new drug spice. You know, and I, I, I'm witnessing it, and I started. This is where the second story comes in. I started to write about what my journey from being released from Wandsworth was like up until the present day. You know, the cancer, the contributing factors that led to me relapse, um, the crime that I committed. It was a resentment with my neighbour. I went through his house and got arrested, charged, and because of my history, I got a sentence. You know, it's embarrassing, and I feel really ashamed of. The actions, because you're in the public eye now. Yeah. So anything you do is going to be yeah. blown out of proportion as well. I'm not. Um, and so you're off, big man. It's nice to see you. Um, because anything you do, from being on the red carpet in Cannes, from doing movies with uh, Sylvester Stallone, and anything you do now, it's going to be a hundred times worse than what it actually is. Yeah. But you've got to kind of take that on the shoulder. You've got to kind of take that on the chin as well. But for moving on for the future for you, what's the plans and where do you see yourself now that you're clean, now that you're sober, now that you're cancer free? Do you, does that scare you as well that the cancer could come back or does it scare you that, the, listen, we could all relapse. I don't know what the fuck's around the corner. I don't know what's happening tonight. Me, you could be lying in a, a crack down yeah. <laughs> the night. Sharing, sharing a pipe <laughs> arguing over a, a or something. Flight over to Thailand. <laughs> so, but the plans for the future, what's the... What do you see? There's a future bright for you. Surely it is because everything you've came through, you're, a, you're clearly a strong character. You've, just, you've beat cancer. You're, you're writing a second book. So what do you see yourself in the future this time? Do you see it positive, happy? See, my life today, right, is I live with my mum in a bungalow, sleeping on a sofa, wearing a tag, in a house with seven little dogs, all little bichons, right? Um, I, I was released from prison Christmas Eve. I had high expectations of, of doing things. Um, I felt ashamed of going to prison and, and the public flog and I'd probably received. And, and to be fair, it, it wasn't that bad. People kind of understood. Channel 4 News, fucking hell, they're horrible. Um, they had a different agenda, which upset me. Um, but I had interviews with Professor Green and, and the Independence and and Liverpool Echo, and they were quite fine, you know what I mean? They were quite understanding of him, of his demise and his journey. But yeah, you know, since I've been out, I've kind of put me focus in, in, in teaching young kids, you know, how to box. Um, I'm a chair, I'm a chairman for a knife gang, well, a knife crime campaign in Liverpool. It's called Platform for Change, near Danny's place, and it's, you know, it's, it's me and people in the community coming together to kind of guide young kids into a new way of living. And it's it, that's important. I don't think, you know, I wish I had someone when I was younger to, 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 to give me that guidance and that direction. It was quite different. You know, I don't think we had that kind of funding back then, but it's nice to, um, to have the opportunity to help someone else. You know, yeah. that altruism, being altruistic, being, being there for... 
It's, I'm not asked about money. I'll tell you that, James, right? I never have been. I've not got a fucking pot of piss in. I couldn't care less. I enjoy life. I enjoy living. Um, if I can put a smile on your face, <laughs> right, that rewards me. Yeah. Um, if you can pick up the phone and want to speak to me and go, Bill, do you know what? I've got a problem here. Can you, can you listen to what I've got to say and, and maybe, you know, share a bit of your experience? Then that's enough. Um, I'm not muddy orientated. Never have been. I'd be nice. You know, meet you misery a bit more luxurious. Yeah, but um, it's never it's never been a big, big, big thing of mine. Got a little car. Um, and, I, and I build on that relationship up with my mum. You know, I'm not going to... I'll assume progress to moving off the couch uh, yeah. to the place. <laughs> you know, but I'm quite happy being here at the minute. Um, but again, it's all... You know what needs to be done now. Yeah. You've wrote a successful book, bestseller. Yeah. You've created a film from it. So who says you can't do it again? This time you have more on the ball because in this industry, a lot of people are out to fuck you. Yeah. And you've clearly we had a chat earlier where you're only getting a very small percentage, a very, very small percentage yeah. of the things that you're doing and it's your life. It's other people that that is rewarding and benefiting from yeah. it. Yeah. I think people always ask me the same question. There's two questions that I've always been asked lately. Was that scene in the film with the ladyboy through? No, it wasn't. Uh, and how much are you getting? And I, you'd get more on benefits than you would today from making a movie. That's the truth. You know what I mean? Um, it's crazy, isn't it? It is. It's people think you you write a story and, and they make a movie about your life and, and you're loaded. But that's not the truth. You know what I mean? Same, I'm, same you went to prison there, the, the last thing. That was after the film, and that was after everything, wasn't it? Yeah. Were you still in contact? Did a lot of people turn their back on you? How was it for you, that experience? Because I know you just said you did it clean, so obviously you're more aware. Yeah. Where you're aware of your actions even more. And we speak about it all the time on this show. That the, the, only, the only people who, who maintained contact was Joe Cole, the actor. You know, I'd contact him. Uh, we, were, we were speaking, you know, a lot on the phone whilst I was away. And he was non-judgmental. He was very supportive. He, he was understanding, and that's because he spent a lot of time with me, and he knows me, and he knows with sound the clear of mind that most of the things that I did, I wouldn't do, uh, in, in in clean. So, you know, he was he was there for me, and and, and a few of the distributors, and they were there. They were supportive, and they helped me when I got out. You know, and the producers they moved on, especially the ones in Liverpool. You know, I'm quite upset that the way. They turn it back on me, you know. I committed a crime, you know. It's not a crime, but a sense, you know. I, I, I'm not uh, proud of that fact, but I didn't get up one day and go, I'm going to do that, and that's just what I'm going to harm other people, you know what I mean? Um, and it, it's, uh, you know, it saddens me today, you know what I mean? It really, really does. I feel. There's no what, fuck them. Yeah. We all make mistakes. We're all going to, we don't know what's around the corner, and yeah, we, we regret things that we do, but we're human. You're a man enough to accept it and you're man enough to move on from it. So yeah, for yeah. me, anybody that's turned their back on you, fuck them. Fuck them. Do you know what I mean? You've you've been in a lot more lonely positions than waiting for someone to maybe get you a letter up or try and help you out. But again, you've come through the mill, you've come through that much in your life to mm -hmm. to get to where you are to where you are now. Now you're fighting fit again. Yeah. You're doing big things, mate. So and now you're doing the knife crime things. I wouldn't it can be disheartening. See when you we, after the book came out and the film came out is that when you started dabbling again and the drugs did it get did it the attention kind of push over the edge and no but it was the moments I got diagnosed with uh, cancer and then a, the reintroduction back to opiates now as I said at the beginning of the interview I'm the kind of person that you know you know, I'm allergic to drugs if I don't I don't break out in lumps and bumps I break out in pain misery and loss and he ends up in handcuffs this is what happens so when I got reintroduced back to uh, opiates, you know, the doctor would give me painkillers and tell me to take two every four hours. And then I'd start abusing them. I'd take four every four hours, then it'd be six. And then I'd like the feelings and then I'd be like, me, me mind would be clouded with all this kind of, these drugs. And I didn't want to feel no more. And, you know, before long, I'm in the grip of addiction and I'm snowballing massively into it. And my drugs become more important than my life, than my family, than my friends. I separate myself. Um, so it was, it was on that. It was just, I was in cans under the influence. And you wouldn't know, you wouldn't tell, because I, I heard it really well from everyone. 
We are good on hiding. Addicts are the yeah, best well, that we can hide and lie. I was manipulative, I'd blame, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd blame it on the illness, I'd blame it on the cancer, you know, you look like you've lost a bit of weight, oh yeah, well, you know why, and, you know, and to be honest, right, James, I was, I get like really, like nervous when it comes to interviews, and, uh, and, and I remember getting interviewed, well, being interviewed by a few people, and it becomes scripted, and I've seen that to you before, yeah, I don't yeah, really yeah. want to sound like someone who's reading off a, a, yeah, a script. Yeah, talking the same know. stuff. You know, I enjoy, um, I enjoy my life, you know, we've only got a few short decades here, you know, I want to do something good with it. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to enjoy it, you know what I mean? I want to, um, I, I want other people to enjoy theirs. Um, if I can help you, yeah. If you're willing to meet me halfway, then fine. Uh, if you want to help me, then you know, and I'll meet you halfway, then that's that's good. You know, I haven't got a, I haven't got a, I haven't got a publisher for this new book. You know, I've, I've been hurt and I'm misled and you know, loads of trust issues over the the last um, three, four years. Three or four years. You probably had trust issues all your life, but then yeah. when you start seeing people being sleeker and, yeah. and fucking your left, right, and centre again, then your trust issues are, issues are going to come back. So for anybody watching, because we get a, a lot of people watching and listening. Because we want to get your second book published. Yeah. We want to even get it made into a second film. So for anybody watching or listening, get involved. How can people get in contact with you, Billy? Uh, you can contact me via Twitter or, you know, I've got an email. It's billymore35 at yahoo.co.uk. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook, <laughs> all the social media Everything. sites. Yes, yeah, definitely get involved. I'm quite, I'm quite, I'm quite, I've got Instagram, I'm quite open. You know what I mean? To get anybody to get involved in. I get your, again that's a your story going through the cancer the other story of being back in prison it's as a you have got a story to tell and people are interested and in, even though it can be against your misery which is tough do you know what it's mad isn't it because I don't think I've got like a story to tell I think I'm just another and when I hear it I cringe really I think embarrassed yeah I get embarrassed um, I even get embarrassed about Selling people a great one, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course, but you've still got to value your worth because when we do good things, we spoke about it earlier, we feel as if we don't deserve it. Yeah, Why are we doing this? We, we don't deserve it to be standing on a red carpet. We don't deserve to be making a film with the good actors and, and and that's just because we've been told we're not good enough for yeah. such a young age, we feel as if. But yeah. again, fuck everybody else. We've all got a past. We all make mistakes, but anybody can change. I don't give a fuck who you are. So for, for anybody, we get a lot of people who's got addiction problems and who watch this show as well. For anybody in the struggle, what advice would you give them right now? Because you're eight, 18 months clean again. You're back on the path. You're, you're thinking straight. You're wanting to do good things. So what kind of advice would you give for someone who's in the struggle? I just say, look, if you're going to struggle, struggle with a smile and, uh, you know, take each day as it comes. And it's stay vigilant. Uh, don't take life too seriously. But take your recovery, make sure your recovery is important. It's like, I, I go to meetings and, and, and I hear people talk about recovery and I hear people talk about clean time. And, and after the time, it's, it, it, it's self talk, that negative talk. I feel shit today, oh, this, that, and the other. And I think, do you know what? The more you sell yourself that, the more you're going to believe it, the more you're going to condition yourself when you start telling yourself it's okay. You know, you're alive, you've got food in the cupboards, you've got a roof over your head. Some people mightn't have that, but you've got people in your life who'll support you and who are willing to help you. And and that's what it's about. It's about turning up. You know, I've got a head full of cartoons. My head is like, <laughs> it, 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 I get obsessed. I, 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 and then composed to do things. Um, at the minute, I'm, I'm on a mad kind of training regime where I want to drop a few pounds because I feel fat. And people say, you look great. But to me, I don't, I, 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 I fucking, I think, oh, you look overweight and, you know, yeah. and you need to be fit. And I forget that I'm 46. You know, and I can go rounds with MMA fighters and, you know, and I can do an hour non-stop on an Eamon and, and shake it so I can get in the ring and spar them. But in here, we're still 16 and 18. Yeah, yeah, I'm st still a kid. I'm still yeah, young. I'm still, still young man. But again, I said to you earlier, you have lost a lot of weight. Yeah. You're clearly on the path. You're clearly doing well again. And it's great to see you, mate, because you're a, a fucking diamond. You're a good guy, Billy. Thank you. I wish you all the best for the future. The girl from... Exercise for less because we're in this gym and we'll give her a shout out. Kaylee. Kaylee, she's hiding now. Yeah, she's um, hiding. For using her gym. Yeah, and thanks, yeah, thanks to Kaylee. Man. How can we get, how can people get involved in your book, Prayer Before Dawn? You can get that on Amazon. Amazon? Yeah, I think it's, there's a few. I mean, you've only got to Google a Prayer yeah, Before yeah, yeah. Dawn, it'll come up. You know, and you can Amazon. watch it on YouTube. Also, you can pay for it on YouTube. And we're also. Stay on demand. Yeah, and we're, yeah Google. and we're trying to get it on Netflix. There's also, um, I had, there's also on the DVD. 
there's an interview or a documentary with me, Professor Green, but you can only watch that if you buy the DVD. You see it, don't. It's uh -huh. not on YouTube. That it's mad. Um, it's just quite interesting. Uh -huh. you know what I mean. But for anybody get involved, anybody can help Billy out with his new book or documentaries or whatever, because he's got some stories. A great guy. Again, if you want anything to promote or anything, your anything is that it? Yeah, that's it. That's Done. brilliant. Thank you very much, Billy, James. Listen for coming on today and telling your story. I appreciate that, sure. brother. Yeah. Great guy. Thank you.